Okay, people, we're in, uh, you guessed it, Good Morning Friends, Volume 3, and let's hit 41 and 42. Forty-one, how to pray. Part thirteen, forgive us. June the fifth, nineteen fifty-six. Good morning, friends. One of the most objectionable aspects of Scripture to many people is its constant emphasis on sin. Many people prefer to bypass this unpleasant reality in the hopes of eliminating it. But such a strategy is as hopeless as trying to eliminate the sun by closing our eyes to it. The Lord's Prayer asks for us, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Some versions read transgressions for debts. Perhaps the clearest expression of this Nil desperandum la 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 Perhaps the clearest expression of its essential meaning is to be found in Luke's version of the prayer. Forgive us our sins, Luke 11.4. By sin, Scripture certainly has reference to all those offences and transgressions whereby men offend God and seek to hurt their fellow men. It has reference, however, not only to the act, but to the life behind the act, the heart mind and will which impel a man to a course of rebellion against God. Both the condition and act characterized even the greatest saint in his life, and the life of faith shows a constant yearning for victory through the forgiveness and grace of God through Jesus Christ. When we pray for and receive forgiveness, it means that we are restored to communion with God and receive his grace and fellowship. God, forgiving all our sins through Jesus Christ, treats us as though we were lost focus. Treats us as though we are sinless. Oh, hang on a second, what happened there? Treats us as though we are sinless, as sinless. Let's try that again. God, forgiving all our sins through Jesus Christ, treats us as though we are. And a little bit unclear there. I don't know about you. God, forgiving all our sins through Jesus Christ, treats us as though we are sinless as Jesus Christ. And when we become members of him, such a purity is imputed to us and then works in us to accomplish its implications. Our sin and our iniquities he will remember no more. See Hebrews 10.17 As far as the east is from the west, so hath he removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 103.12 Such is the forgiveness we receive, but we receive it day by day as we also give it. The forgiveness of justification is there, but the daily grace and cleansing, the sanctifying love, are given on another basis. The petition makes this clear. Forgive us as we forgive. The force of this is given further emphasis by our Lord in his insistent declarations. Forgive and ye shall... Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. If ye will not forgive, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Mark 11.26 Too many Christians are receiving no answers to their prayers because they nurse an unforgiving spirit. The Lord makes it clear that what we want from him we must be willing to give to others. His forgiveness is absolute. 
He buries our past completely and gives us a totally new status and a new life as well. Hello, this is Nathan. Thanks for joining me in the booth. I really hope you're enjoying the live streams and videos. To find out more about this narration project, or to make a donation, go to nathanteacher.com. Thanks. The divine forgiveness not only cancels our sin, but blots it out as well. When God's forgiveness towards us is so great, it can only be accounted in gratitude and rebellion on our parts when we refuse to extend forgiveness to others for offence. Try, try that again. When God's forgiveness towards us is so great, it can only be accounted in gratitude and rebellion on our part when we refuse to extend forgiveness to others for offences or transgressions which are, by comparison, so little. Moreover, we reveal whether we want forgiveness by the way we give it. Harsh and unforgiving people are more insistent on their righteousness than the righteousness of Christ. They do not forgive others because they fail to see how much they need to be forgiven. When we pray, forgive us as we forgive, God takes us at it. God takes us. God takes us. God takes us at our word. He allows no trifling with words, and out of our own mouth he shames us. If we are insincere. And out of our own mouth he shames us if we are insincere in this petition. But if we indeed forgive as we have been forgiven, then the grace of God flows richly and freely into our lives and through us into the lives of others. We then walk, in the words of Dr. James Reed, in the realm of mercy, not of merit. And to walk in a world of mercy is to live in a realm of inexhaustible love and peace. I can not have that present. Oops. <clears throat> and to walk in a world of mercy is to live in a realm of inexhaustible love and peace, in an area of wealth and power, and above all, to walk in freedom. Forgiveness gives us liberty from the past and victory over it. It releases us from hatred and resentment. It moves in a world wholly ruled by God and therefore to be left to his will. His, oh, uh, oh, hang on. Wholly ruled by God and therefore to be left to his all-wise government. The freedom of forgiveness is the glorious liberty of the sons of God and at the heart of their new life. Oh, hang on. I didn't quite get that either. The freedom of forgiveness is the glorious liberty of the sons of God and at the heart of their new life. Out of forgiveness, the forgiveness of Calvary, comes the great regeneration the new heaven and new earth, and the glory of the resurrection of the dead. Forgiveness is freedom under God and the essence of our liberty. Forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ is the beginning of our liberty, and our extension of that forgiveness to those who sin against us is the realisation and the application of our freedom. We reveal whether we have been forgiven by the all right, we're just um, a bit, a bit, bit of sticking, a bit of friction. 
we reveal whether we have forgiveness. Just a little bit insecure here, not quite sure what's up. We reveal whether we have forgiveness by the way we give it. O oh Lord our God, forgive as we forgive. Okay, sorry for the stutters there, the um, impromptu nonsense. Okay, let's skip to the loo, um, as it were. 42. Forty-two, how to pray. Part fourteen, temptation. June the twelfth, nineteen fifty-six. Good morning, friends. Perhaps the most difficult petition in the Lord's Prayer is the last. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The very wording of this plea recognizes two basic facts. First, that God can and often does lead us into a place of temptation because all our ways are in his hands, and second, having led us into such a testing, only he can deliver us. To understand our deliverance from evil and from the evil one, we must first understand the meaning of God's guidance. What is the meaning of temptation in our life? God never leads us into sin, but he often leads us into temptation. Of Jesus himself, it is said that he was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Matthew 4 1. Paul wrote, There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which ye are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10 13. In other words, Paul asserted that God provides both the temptation and the way of escape. To understand why God so leads us, we need to understand the meaning of temptation. Temptation can be either the prelude to sin or the prelude to victory. Our Lord's temptation in the wilderness was the beginning of the restoration of paradise, whereas Adam's temptation in the garden turned the world into a wilderness. Our Lord's life was full of temptations. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15 The wilderness temptation was followed by many others. But, having met these temptations victoriously, he could say of himself at the Last Supper, The Prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me. John 14.30 It has been well said, no man has been through the university of life till he has been shalabata shalabati. All right, let's just do a little bit of this business. Let's scoop that in. No man has been through the university of life till he has been well tempted. Thus, we can be sure that God's guidance means testing for us, means tribulation and temptation. And yet, we are asked to pray, lead us not into temptation. And God never asks us to pray for anything which he does not intend to give. This petition needs to be understood in terms of its relationship to the previous one. Forgive us as we have been forgiven. To pray for either means to pray for both. To know forgiveness is to know its cost to God, the blood of Jesus Christ. And to know this cost is to hate sin and our inclination to sin and to pray earnestly for deliverance from it. Thus, in our petition we pray not for an easy life, far removed from all testing and temptation, but for a victorious life one free from any offence against our Redeemer. The heart of the petition is seen in the latter half. Deliver us from evil. The petition is a cry for guidance, for God's leading to preserve us, 
not from any and all testing, but only from temptation to sin, from a surrender to evil. This is a plea for sanctification, for growth in the Lord and in his Spirit. Sometimes the only way we can be delivered from evil is to be tested, tried and refined by fire. Temptation is either the prelude to victory or the prelude to sin. In either case do we enjoy it. But the heart of our plea is for deliverance, not from testing but from evil. Lead us, we pray, into no temptation that will deliver us to evil. Remember our frailty and may thy testing and leading be only into that which we are able to bear for our sanctification in thee. Jesus Christ accepted temptation for all of us in the wilderness and gained victory for all who by faith lay hold of his salvation into that temptation. He was driven or led by the Holy Spirit in order that he did it. Uh, okay, all right, I just got that wrong, didn't I? Punctuation. Into that temptation, he was driven or led by the Holy Spirit in order that he might gain the victory that could be won on no other battleground. To meet that temptation, he prayed. We are called upon to meet our temptations by prayer and by the might of the Spirit of God to meet them as members of Christ that we might share in his victory. We pray for God's guidance so that we might be delivered from the evil one and God leads us with this purpose, our sanctification, so that the time may come when the prince of this world finds nothing in us and we stand redeemed in Christ before the throne of his glory, eternally delivered from all evil and delivered into eternal life by his grace. Therefore, in the words of James, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. James 1, 2-4 Many amens, big bombs of amens, amen, 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 amen. Okay, I'm going to do some housekeeping here. Not that you're going to notice. I'm going to start that render queue. How do you do? And uh, I'll ho I hope to see you. Hang on. I hope to see you in uh, the next uh, 43 and 44. See you soon. Okay, folks, we are in... Volume 3 of Good Morning Friends, and uh, just need to up the volume, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, that's better, 1, 2, okay, so we're looking at ver uh, chapters 43 and 44, let's go. Forty-three, How to Pray, Part 5. Part 15 Part 15 Doxology June the 19th, 1956 Good morning, friends. The Lord's Prayer concludes with a glorious doxology which echoes the essence of Old Testament faith. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. In David's benediction, we have the same witness. Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, for ever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and is... and the majesty... For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head over all. First Chronicles 29, 10 and 11 Psalm 115 begins, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. 
Psalm 115, 1. Behind these joyful declarations stands the basic biblical witness. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all that dwell therein, and they that dwell therein. The world and they that dwell therein. Psalm 24, 1. Everything that is, was created, is sustained, and absolutely governed by Almighty God, and is therefore in total dependence upon God. The very reason why we approach God in prayer, making all our spiritual and material wants and wishes known to Him, is given in this joyful doxology. We ask Him because His is indeed the kingdom, the power and the glory. Thus the heart of prayer is well stated by David. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Psalm 39, 7 My soul, wait thou only upon God. Psalm 62, 5 We cannot pray except in this spirit and in this faith. For he that cometh... Try again. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11.6 Thus, one of the most significant aspects of the modern decline in the prayer life is well stated by Peter Eldersveld. Men have become so big and God has become so small. Men have come to boast in all their doings that theirs is the kingdom the power and the glory. Today, man is in process, in the process. Today, man is in the process of destroying the world and himself while boasting of soon conquering time, space and even death. The more desperate his condition becomes, the more extravagant his boasting. When a British astronomer expressed some elementary humility with regard to the difficulties of space travel, he was reprimanded by other scientists. Man feels himself too big to pray. His hope is in himself, and there is... And there is his frustration. Our world has become man-centred and as a result is frustrated in the midst of plenty, whereas our forefathers in faith rejoiced in the face of want. Our world has become man-centred, and accordingly its vision is out of focus, and where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29.18 The doxology is a joyful one, because it rejoices in God's omnipotence and government, being confident of its purpose and its glorious end. It calls upon us to be anxious about nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made on... Let your requests be made known unto God. Philippians 4, 6. It declares our faith... It declares our faith that... Okay, I wasn't quite getting that... It declares our faith that our fulfilment is in God and that only the government and the grace of God can answer the hunger and thirst of our being. It declares that there is nothing we cannot ask for. Just having some difficulties here, folks. It declares that there is nothing we cannot ask God for because all things are his and it is his express desire that we look unto him for all things. More than that, it implies that our very... Just having some difficulty here, folks. Bear with me. More than that, it implies that our very growth is to be measured in terms of our increasing reliance and trust in the Lord for all things, and our obedience to him according to his word. 
We can therefore approach with happy confidence the Lord who... Ah, sorry, that's just an awkward phrasing for my mind. We can therefore approach with happy confidence the Lord who not only teaches us to pray, but includes all our needs in that prayer. He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Proverbs 8. Proverbs. <laughs> Proverbs. <laughs> Romans 8.32 For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Okay, I don't need to tell you that that was a bit awkward. Oh, God of mercy. Okay, levels are likely good by the looks of things. Okay, so let's skip on to 44. Sip of water and then it'll skip. Forty-four. How to pray. Part 16. Amen. June the 26th, 1956. Good morning, friends. Our prayers are ended with the most significant word, Amen. The word Amen is rendered in our Bible also as verily, a favourite word of our Lord. It means firm, true, reliable, something that cannot be shaken. We are asked to pray always in Jesus' name, and the only Christian prayer which is not in Jesus' name is the Lord's Prayer, where the use of his name is made unnecessary because we pray in his own words. When Jesus puts the Amen to his own prayer, he declares that God's promise to hear and answer that prayer is unshakable. And when we pray, in Jesus' name, Amen, we declare that because we pray in and through Jesus Christ, we pray in the confidence that God's promise is unshakable. He will hear an answer out of heaven, and he will reveal himself as the God who hearkens unto prayer. Jesus Christ summoned us to pray in this confidence when he declared, Verily, verily, or Amen, Amen, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. John 16.23 here is a double Amen, a double assurance from God the Son. Yeah, it's just not good enough in that instance. Okay, we've got a rocky start. Can we get away with a sneaky peeky? Let's try that. See if anybody notices. Here is a double Amen. A double assurance from God the Son of his promise to hear and answer. Is it any wonder that James 4, 2 and 3 asserted that ye have not because ye ask not, ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts? The word Amen is thus a word of great importance and great significance. To say Amen is to place our confidence in an unshakable God whose absolute government is our only confidence. When Moses pronounced the curses on sin in Deuteronomy 27, the repeated refrain required of the congregation is specifically stated, And the people shall say, Amen. Their Amen was the recognition of the whole purpose of God to bless faith and obedience and to curse unbelief and disobedience. Amen is the response of faith to the sovereignty of God and his saving grace in Jesus Christ. In saying, oh, sorry. In saying Amen, we affirm our confidence in our Creator and Redeemer. We ask of him our daily needs, and we give to him our joyful confidence as our thanks offering. In the words of William Van per Pearson, In the words of William Van Persum, 
Amen is also the renewal of our dedication to God. As God gives himself to us, we give ourselves to God. God has bound himself to us by his Amen, and we bind ourselves to him by our Amen. We sometimes hear it said that Amen means so be it. More accurately, it means so it is. Oh, so, so it is. It's a bit of Irish. It means so is it, or so it shall be, and is closely related to the basic meaning unshakable, firm, or supported. When we say Amen, we declare our faith that God holds as true the declaration of our lips, or will or can make it true, it is thus again a witness to the sovereignty and grace of God. In some churches, the people say Amen to underscore the preaching, and this too is a proper use of Amen, which is so used in Revelation 22.20, and it is a witness to our believing acceptance of the word of God. The use of Amen is noteworthy in Isaiah 45.15, where the prophet proclaims, Verily thou art a God that hideth thyself, O God of Israel, the Saviour, as well as in Revelation 3.14, where it is a name or description of Christ. The Amen, the faithful and true witness. God is the great Amen, the faithful and unshakable one, and Jesus Christ is God's resounding Amen declared unto earth, his unshakable justice revealed on Calvary, and his faithful love revealed in grace unto salvation. Of him Paul writes, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. 2 Corinthians 1.20 In him we have the glorious assurance of which Romans 8.32 in Moffat's translation speaks, The God who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, Surely he will give us everything besides. Blessed be the Lord for evermore. Amen and Amen. Psalm 89, 52. All righty. Well, that was fairly decent. I sometimes worry that I'm too wooden, you know. So... Okay, all right. Well, I'm um, going to take a break for the camera's sake and then see you and uh, go well on 45 and 46. Okay, where are we? We are in, not there. Nope. We're here. Okay, 45 and 46 of volume three of Good Morning Friends. 45. How to pray. Part 17. Consequences of Prayer July the 10th, 1956 Good morning, friends. Scripture speaks frequently and compellingly of both the obligation to pray and the consequence of prayer. We are told, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Mark 9.23 What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them, Mark 11.24. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us, and if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. 1 John. 1 John. First John five fourteen and 15 Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33, 3 The man of faith is the man who lives, with all prayer and supplication, praying at all seasons in the Spirit, and watching thereunto in all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Ephesians six eighteen ASV By prayer we are brought nigh to God and to his blessings for us. 
While we are not promised that we will be spared from troubles and hardships, we are definitely promised that through them we shall be delivered into greater good and the very trials made the means of blessing. Why then is it that Christians are so slow in praying? Hang on a second. Oh, brother. Just going to raise the gain a little bit here. Uh, okay, just uh, lost my place there. Why then is it that Christians are so slow in praying? Through prayer we can have access to the throne of God. Through prayer we can make intercession for those whom we love as well as for ourselves. Through prayer we draw nigh to God and are made strong in faith and hope. We lose nothing by praying except our burdens and we gain so much. Then why are we so often slow to pray when we are quick to complain? The answer is almost painfully obvious. To pray, we must love both God and our neighbour. To pray, we must enjoy fellowship with the Lord and have a loving concern for our fellow man. Fellow men. And have a loving concern for our fellow men. Shalom. And have a loving concern for our fellow men. If we are to pray, we must love. And if we do not pray or pray only a little, it is because we have little or no love for God and for our neighbour. Thus, if we are not praying, we are neglecting more than prayer. We are neglecting our obligation to love God with all our heart, mind and being, and our neighbour as ourself. The love of God is practically revealed in our joy in his word and in his sovereignty and in love for one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. John 13, 50. John 13, 35. Peter asked the Christians of his day this standard. Above all things, being fervent in your love among yourselves, 1 Peter 4, 8, ASV. The word for fervent has also been rendered by other translators. translators. The word for fervent has also been rendered by other translators as constant, unfeeling and intense, any way we render it, it presents an embarrassing obligation to most Christians whose attitude towards their fellow members can sometimes scarcely be called love. What more fervent, what more, what more fervent, that doesn't quite make sense to me. Hang on a second. What more fervent or unfeeling love? But Scripture plainly declares that the fruit of the Spirit is a love, Galatians 5.22, and that if the Spirit of God dwell within us, he will manifest himself in love through us, and love reveals itself also in intercessory prayer for one another. The great high priestly prayer of our Lord, recorded in John 17, reveals this clearly as characterising the essence of our Lord's intercession for us. He prayed that they may all be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me, and that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. John eighteen twenty one to 23 and 26. The prophets of the Old Testament were called not only to speak for God, but to plead with him for their people, in the words of Isaiah 62, 6 and 7, I have set my watchmen. Yeah, I just didn't know what, whether it was watchman or watchman. 
I have set my watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day or night. Ye that are the Lord's remembrance, remem rem remembrancers, remembrancers, The mm, Ye that are the Lord's remembrancers, keep not silence and give him no rest. This duty belongs now to all who are members of Christ, to be watchmen on the walls, and seeing the course of things, to be intercessors with God through Christ, to keep not silence and give him no rest. To be slow in praying means that we are slow in loving, too much wrapped up in ourselves to think of God and our neighbour. We need all of us to echo the words of Elizabeth Prentice's hymn, 1856. More love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee. Hear thou the prayer I make on bended knee. This is my earnest plea. More love, O Christ, to thee. More love to thee. More love to thee. Jesus asks Peter, Simon, son of John, Do you love me? When Peter insisted that he did, Jesus immediately pointed to a responsibility. Feed my sheep. Essential to all our responsibilities to God and man is a prayer relationship to God. If in this we are faithful, then God will be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, that his way may be known upon the earth, his saving health among all nations. Psalm 67, 1 and 2. Okay, well, um, nothing spectacular there, I'm afraid. All right, so just going to take a brief drink. May God be gracious to us. God have mercy. Forty-six. How to pray. Part eighteen. Striving in Prayer July the 17th, 1956 Good morning, friends. One of the curious aspects of biblical phraseology as it concerns prayer is that it is spoken as work. Uh, is that it is spoken? One of the curious aspects of biblical phraseology as it concerns prayer is that it is spoken of as work and wrestling. Jacob's encounter with the angel of his presence was a wrestling in prayer. Paul summoned the Christians of Rome to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, Romans 15.30, and the word strive is translated by Williams as wrestle. We find the same usage in Colossians 4.12 and 13 ASV, where Paul speaks of Epaph Epaphras, should have known that. Should have known that. Mm. We find the same usage in Colossians four twelve and thirteen ASV, where Paul speaks of Epaphras as always striving for you in his prayers. At first glance, it seems strange that such language should be applied to this simple act of prayer, but on second thought, it becomes increasingly apparent that prayer is, after all, not so simple an act. When prayer offers us the omnipotence and love of God as our refuge and strength, it seems natural that we should constantly rely on prayer and resort to it. And yet, so many Christians are slow to pray and quick to say Amen. Despite all of our Despite all our evasiveness, it is apparent that there is some kind of difficulty attached to prayer, and perhaps Paul is right, and Hosea 12.4 also, in speaking of it as wrestling. Certainly the wrestling is not with God. He speaks all too clearly about his delight in hearing us, and of his joy in our conversation. The wrestling, therefore, is, as Hallensby has pointed out, 
quite obviously with ourselves? In the Old Testament, we find believers filled with fear on having a vision of God. This, in fact, was one of the marks of a true vision. Instead of acting as a press agent over his honour, as false prophets of modern times do with regard to their false and pretended visions, the Old Testament prophets were filled with fear and, in fact, even expected to die. The reason was always clear-cut. In God's sight, they saw their own darkness. In the blaze of God's holiness, their own sin stood out, and they felt the force of God's judgment against all sin. Our feeling with regard to prayer is often similar. We are afraid to pray or slow in praying. It is because we are afraid to face God in his holiness when we ourselves are so much at ease in our sin. To draw nigh to God means, therefore, to wrestle with the old Adam in us and to subordinate ourselves totally, even with all our pleading to the most holy and sovereign God. As we prayed for a loved one, as we pray. As we pray for loved ones, the Holy Spirit within us prays with us and also at the same time reminds us how much we have left undone and unsaid in manifesting our love to those whom we ask God to help. When we pray for ourselves, the Holy Spirit says Amen to our prayer and with it reminds us afresh of our sins and our carelessness with our own lives. Thus, prayer can be very embarrassing and it does involve a wrestling with ourselves. But prayer is also a very great joy. The wrestling is nothing compared to the victory it offers. Since our praying is in Jesus' name, our prayer is therefore in the power of his victory. Jacob's wrestling left him crippled for life as far as his pride and self-righteousness were concerned. But that crippling also made him Israel, a prince with God. You and I are called upon to follow Jacob's example in this respect. The more the old Adam in us is crippled, the more we prevail with God and the greater the joy we have in him. Pray therefore and commit yourself into the hands of the Almighty for, as is his majesty, so is his mercy. Sirach 2.18 They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth for ever. As the mountains are around about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth, even forever. Psalm 125, 1 and 2. Okay, well, I'm going to take a break to render Uh, the file. It's going to up again a little bit. And, uh, yeah and uh, we'll be in for the home stretch of the book so hope to see you for 47 and 48 well done for listening right to the end if you would like to know more about this important christian audiobook project please go to nathanteacher.com Thanks.